Hey, this is Say Hello to the Bad Guy, the podcast where a few dudes grab some booze, sit in a room, and bullshit about a tale of a no-good scoundrel. I'm your host, Dan the Man, and with me today is the storyteller and a mighty fine feller, Locke. Hey, what's happening? And our special guest today is our boy, Tank. Hello. <laughs> what's happening, man? You, you went chopper on him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> figured, I, figured I'd get weird. What? Right well, uh, Tank, this ain't your uh, first one on the podcast, but uh, it's a little unreleased gem we got going on here. You feeling any different coming in on the second time? Man, I'm pumped up, man. I uh, It's something I like a lot, and I'm... Uh, I'm ready to to hear the next story and crack some jokes with some uh, brews, my friend. Hell yeah. Now that that hymen's been cracked, we threw away them bloody sheets, and now you're ready to <laughs> relax and enjoy it this time around. You know what I'm saying? So, all right. Our, our grossest intro to date. <laughs> hey, whatever. You know what I'm saying? I, I bring the ruckus. You know what I mean? get this going it's, uh, it's not the nice guy podcast well yeah i mean we're, we're gonna get into some intrigue some murder there's probably gonna be some uh banging uglies in the in the show tonight. who knows you know what i mean well any of these when we cast it we make the movie they're all rated r and there's got to be a sex scene so yeah yeah there's always some yeah fucking. exactly so my rated r movies are 80s rated r movies if there's no titties then what are we even doing <laughs> yeah what are we even doing here i just watch birds of prey now one of the bitches took off their tops <laughs> why bother yeah exactly worst 15 bucks ever spent yeah exactly (laughs) all right well on that note we might as well get this in what do you got for us today well today uh the bad guy that we're gonna be covering is ted rowe this ain't negotiation time this is scarface final scene fucking bazookas under each arm say hello to my little friend so theodore l rowe aka tough teddy i like it already which i I will be calling him ted i believe for most of the podcast because tough tough teddy is a a tough pill to swallow it's it's like a bear a teddy bear made of kevlar (laughs) that's that's like an oxymoron of a name i wonder where it fell in line with the with the president you know like if it was around that time i could see where he's like yeah yeah tough teddy you know well i mean teddy roosevelt was a rough rider so maybe this guy's a tough rider well you know nowadays we live in a much softer time like back then it was more important that everybody knew like hey no i am tough okay <laughs> it's and right in my nickname it. and i said it and it was up front if i wasn't then why would i say i am <laughs> ted rowe was born august 26 1898 in galliano louisiana Ooh, louisiana eh? well he didn't spend too much time there though he was the son of a sharecropper and he was raised in little rock arkansas his mom was black. His dad was half black, half Italian. Growing up as a young black man in Arkansas in the early 1900s. He, he really... was living the dream. <laughs> <laughs> the, from this picture, there's obviously no no hardships. Everything's great. Oh, no. The life of a sharecropper. I mean, everybody dreamed to yep. one day grow up and be a sharecropper. I mean, it's after the Civil War, right? Ever, racism was fixed after that, right? <laughs> I mean, I was led to believe everything was fine. Have you guys ever seen the the do- HBO documentary Banging in Little Rock? No. No, but is this where the sex comes in? <laughs> it's from the 90s, and then they did a follow-up, Banging in Little Rock 2, like 10 years later. Electric uh, Boogaloo? I haven't seen it, but now that you said that, it, it, yeah, because it's about the Little Rock uh, gang scene, right? And, yeah. And the, the, the original one was around the, the Clinton years now, right? Because he was from Little Rock. Yeah, All right, never take a seat, Locklear. Never take, <laughs> take, tell us the tale. <laughs> <laughs> but I still ain't, I still ain't seen it, so uh, I'm slightly familiar with your shit. Well, I, I guess the moral of the story would be this is the 1900s. When we get into the 1990s, Little Rock, Ar- or Arkansas, was still uh, it's still ain't. a rough place to grow up. Receiving no, no formal education, he ended up picking up a job as a tailor where you do odd jobs, cleaning up and, you know, sweeping stuff like that, and eventually learn how to, you know, apply a trade as a tailor. Okay. Work your way up. Back then, decent trade to have. I mean, you're going to stay busy, right? Right. People don't just buy new clothes back then. I mean, that's the back then thing. Like, you didn't get an education, but you learned the skill. Today, you see it all the time. Like, we need more people in the trades. We need, because everyone got to the education thing, but like, you didn't learn a skill. Like, back then, you can have no education, but then you just got a job sweeping up then you just learned a skill either you were a blacksmith a tailor whatever a baker but whatever it was you learned a specific skill and that was your shit proud of it (laughs) 
and you know not looking to get well i mean obviously you're looking to get as easy money as possible but proud of your trade but like you said nowadays today they they just want to teach you how to sit behind a desk and run spreadsheets and stuff yeah but that's I my mean, gig you're just cogging the wheel i'm gonna get octave in here man you need some illegalism you know, l- luckily i'm fairly tough skin i know i got a sissy job i, I mean know. i had to have you adjust this mic i couldn't twist the thing strong if it's enough. any consolation my knees and back are fucked all right <laughs> man he didn't even need a leatherman to do it <laughs> Inside jokes. He plied his trade as a tailor until Prohibition was enacted in January 17th of 1920. He began bootlegging. He was known as a flashy racketeer, too wild for the understaffed local sheriffs to handle. So they kind of had just an understanding where as long as he didn't get too out of control and they didn't have to worry about him. See, that was was like, he's so great. We'll we'll let him do some shit. As long as he doesn't get too wild, we'll just let him be. You don't want to fuck with him. (laughs) You know what I picture when I was like, well, boy, he's a good old boy. You know, just just don't get too wild now. (laughs) Uh, A quote about him at the time, he said he was a tough guy with a quick temper. He could back his rap with his fists, and he never backed down from a fight. Well, the name Tough Teddy seems to fit. (laughs) So there's no real... Because some of these people, like, they were abused by their dad. They had a rough chart. I mean, we've heard they got locked up when they were, like, four years old because they wanted to quit their job that they had at two. Like, we hear a lot of shit. But this guy, it just all starts. He just... From the fucking slums, black dude in Little Rock gets big and tough and just enters bootlegging. Basically. I'm huh? oh, sorry. Did you did you say how like what his stature was and like how? Uh, I didn't say yet, but he's okay. big. Okay. Later on, he will be described as tall. Oh, all right. On this podcast, usually when they lead with describing a guy as tough guy, it's because he's a little he's a little guy, and everybody wants to make sure <laughs> that you know that he's not to be fucked with. Yeah, he's a little scrappy dude. Yeah, he's not. He's he's, he's a great dame. He's <laughs> yeah. the he's the tried and true since the beginning a time i'm scared of this dude tall guy yeah gotcha in 1923 he met fell in love with and married the love of his life he took his bootleg and nest egg went straight and him and carrie Rowe moved to detroit where ted got a job at an automotive plant oh right okay. local boy and that's it that's the story of ted Rowe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what year did you say he moved again uh 1923 okay so 19... he's 25 I mean, in the 20s, I'd assume Detroit's on the upswing. It's starting to boom a little bit. Like, Detroit was probably a hustling, bustling town compared to where he was. Oh, yeah. We're talking prime Henry Ford, model fucking T. Now, you between know, wars and, and yeah. no crazy, we're making everything for the wars and we're sending your wives to the plants shit. You're just swing dancing and just fucking. Just toe tapping. Being tough, Teddy. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm going to go on a limb and say since he was a bootlegger and even though he went straight temporarily because this wouldn't be a tale mm-hmm. if he stayed straight. Detroit's a huge boot. Leg and time. I mean, many people right. that aren't from Detroit don't understand, but because we're right next to Canada, a lot of people in the nation don't realize, like, going, especially back then, before they had lights and everything, you would just get liquor from Canada, Canadian whiskey, mm-hmm. just come right across the river at nighttime. Like <laughs> The de- plant was on the border. It was on the <laughs> river. Like, you can see it from Detroit. Yeah. I don't know what it was like back then, but back, I mean, could you imagine that back at Prohibition? And they're like, they're sitting there like, well, we're fucking whiskey factories just chilling on this uh, riverbank here. What you guys, you guys want some? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, if you're a bootlegger, bootlegger. Leaguer. If you're a bootlegger, <laughs> no, but if you're a bootleg, wow, I cannot say that fucking word. It's a if, rough one. If you sell under the table booze, like Detroit is the fucking place to be. Especially if you're a tough guy like him, like not to go DC with it, but I'm making a, a prediction here. This guy's going to get into some shit. Well, I like the, the DC pre, pre-prediction. pre Dude, that's my favorite because I always think like, nobody says you have to predict what's going to happen, DC. Nobody says it, but in his games, like, well, what I like to do is I like to make these predictions. Hey, like, hey, yeah. do what you hey, do. It's it's his pod. He can pod how he wants to. And what's crazy is he is always right, too. Like, I think he's like, we're going to do a say hello to DC one day because that <laughs> motherfucker always has it right. He always calls it. He knows his criminals when he hears them. <laughs> yeah, I know. In 1929, the plant he worked at closed, and at 31 years old, he moved to the south side of Chicago and got a job at the Jones Brother Taylor shop working for a man named Ed Jones. See, that's what I'm going to get you a skill. He can just bump in the tower and be like, I can cut a mean suit, motherfucker. And like, yeah, you're true. hired. Uh, the area, it was called Bronzeville, the, the south side of Chicago, which is now a really bad neighborhood. At that time, it wasn't a terrible neighborhood. The Jones Brothers, Ed, George, and Mac, their dad had died 
when they were young and left them sixteen thousand dollars. So Ed Jones was the oldest, and he kind of had. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just in my head was just thinking sixteen thousand. I wonder how much that is in today's money. Uh, it's a decent amount because I got like a. <laughs> that was good. You looked it up, I see. <laughs> well, uh, no, I, I didn't look up that, but I have another amount later that I'll cover. So sixteen thousand is a decent amount of money. It's yeah, got, yeah. It's well, I mean, that's a figures. good chunk. Like, I'll take sixteen thousand right now. Well, Ed Jones was the oldest, so he was the one that kind of they were young when his dad died. Okay. So he kind of was the man of the house. All right. He got the sixteen thousand, and uh, him and his brothers first they started a taxi ca- uh, taxi stand, and eventually transferred into that a couple different business. So they had like a couple small businesses, but their main operation that they worked out of was the Jones Brothers Taylor Shop. They were running a small but profitable policy operation out of the back of the tailor shop. What's uh, the policy operation? I, I I too do not know. Have you guys ever seen the money the movie Hoodlum? Yes. No. With Lawrence Fishburne. Tomorrow? I've I've heard of it. I've okay. never checked it out. Hoodlum is based in New York. So there they played the numbers. Mid- yeah, I was going to say, I remember the numbers. Yeah. In Midwest, they did policy, which is fairly the same thing. The difference is it's it's the lottery. So you play the lottery, you pick your numbers, and then they draw the numbers daily, and you keep playing is, is basically what it is. Now, the difference between numbers and policy, I had to dig kind of deep to find this. You will usually just hear them used interchangeably. Okay. The difference, though, was the numbers on the East Coast, what they would do is you play the game the same, but in numbers, whatever the numbers were that day was based on whatever the three closing numbers of the stock market. Oh, okay. So you would do All your right. bets, and at the end of the day, when the paper would come out, whatever the last three numbers of the, the stock market, that would be the numbers that you hit on the lottery. So that one wasn't just like random, like like you just pay attention to the stock market. You just have to try to guess well, what that, the stock market is. That's really tough to say, though, because – those go down to like the oddest of a percent. So no matter how much yeah. you know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I don't know shit, so I don't want to try to explain the stock market, but you're talking about three random numbers at the end. So even yeah. if you really know it, you're not hitting it on the head. Yeah, at, and it's like, like hitting the fucking whammy on that game show, right? Like you don't know where it's going to stop at the end of the day, you, per se. Yeah, like I even if you think saying, it's going to be around 24 points, it you don't know if it's going to be 24.382, 24.586. When he said three digits, exactly. I got the same idea that you did. Like, wait, I got a shot now, like three digits. <laughs> like if you got enough cash, you might be able to fucking pull that off. Well, then it, I thought, nah, man, you can't guess. I mean, it's still random, but at least they can prove that it's not rigged. Like, uh, unfortunately, well, that was on the East Coast. The guy we're talking about, they did a lottery style. So they actually had, so the difference between numbers and policy is policy. They actually had a wheel. So, so they really did it lottery style with the pulling the ball out or whatever. Yeah, they seriously. Today's are. lucky three digit policy. As this gangster shit gets real and people start like migrating and running operations out of different towns, you know, these people start commingling and eventually it turned into spots where you could go do, you could go play the the Harlem numbers, but you could also do the local policy too. Oh, okay. And, and it was huge in these communities because you could play anything, whatever you want. You could play a penny. The, they said a quarter could win you a hundred dollars. The Jones brothers, so they were they were running like a set satellite policy operation, like a franchisee, I guess you could say. Around this time, they decided they wanted to launch their own policy wheel. That was right when Ted Rowe came over with his fancy tailor in, and him and Ed Jones hit it off real well. They started their policy wheel, and Ted Rowe started off on the ground floor. Ted Rowe ends up learning every aspect of the business, and he worked every position from bookkeeper to runner. Okay. And Damn, I wonder where he got, well, I guess Taylor and his, I'm just trying to think like how he got good with numbers. Normally they have like education for that, but I guess if you're a tailor, you got to know some numbers. That's a lot of math. Yeah, I mean, it is. Yeah, I didn't think about that. He's he's pretty resourceful, though. I mean, he came up from the South. He worked in the auto plant for a little bit. You know, he's been a tailor and a couple. He's been, he's, I mean, for his time, he's a globe trotter. So, I mean, I think this guy is uh, smarter than your average bear, per yeah, se. L- world smarter bear. than yeah. your average teddy bear? <laughs> yeah, that's, hey, you know, I didn't even see that. Nice, nice. I think if nothing else, math is one of those skills where you kind of either get it or you don't. Dude, I've said that a thousand times. Like, I honestly think, well, I guess they do sort of do it at school. Like, once you reach a certain level, you got to know how to add shit. You have to know how to do shit. Not everyone needs to know geometry. Not everyone Mm. needs to know all the fraction shit. Of all subjects, math really is one of those things of you just, you got it or you don't. You know, I graduated. I went to college. I've had thousands of hours of sales training. And I suck at math. It means I'm Ted Rowe. It's just kind of some closed auto plant, fist fighting bootlegger. And he's just <laughs> out there running the books and shit. 
he picked up on the business quick. He came up with a bunch of ideas that helped him expand their operation at like like a ridiculous pace. And not only locally, he expanded their policy wheel operations as far as Indiana. So he's bringing into oh, like okay. other like other big cities in different states. So like how they were originally a satellite branch. Once they started their wheel, they had policy the branches like franchises in different states and shit. Talk Teddy so they, brought you Gary, Indiana. Yeah, they're straight Ray Kroc in that McDonald's. Um, oddly enough, yes, specifically Gary, Andy, Indiana. That, and the only reason why I said that is because I. Chicago, I mean, is one of my favorite other cities. Yeah. And, you know, you got to drive through Mofo Gary, Indiana to get to it. So is that the full title? Mofo Gary, Indiana? <laughs> I, I just love the fact of like all of like Pennsylvania isn't named after a guy, but it's William Penn in the name that Pennsylvania. They're like, what are we going to I'll just name it Gary. Gary. <laughs> <laughs> like there's like a Steve, Nebraska somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you from? From Doug. Ted Rowe was their star protege, and by 1930, after only a year in operations, they were making over $2,000 a day, which, this is the math I did earlier, 2000 a day was equivalent of 30000 now. Damn, so if 2000 is 30000 that's 16000 is... That was a grip. Uh, tw- 240,000, I think. See, so, that's that math shit I said I couldn't do. I gotta take back my say with, like, relative. Like, oh, he could have been. No, I think Tough Teddy's, like, a G, man. Tough Teddy just, you know, like you said, some guys just know how to play it, man. I think Tough Teddy just, he he, he gets thrown into a situation and he just figures it out, man. Well, I mean. My little bit of knowledge that I got. Yeah, from. no, I got you. Well, it's kind of crazy that, like, it started off, we just had that one quote and it just sort of resonated with me just he's a big dude that was quick with his hands like i just thought he was like a big tough guy or whatever but it turns out he's a tailor like skilled with his yeah. hands and shit he's running numbers he's, he's franchising <laughs> shit like as of skills. yet i haven't seen like he's not a hired muscle which is in my mind i thought that's where we were going right when you hear tough ted you assume oh yeah so uh, he works the front door right <laughs> he's no like, he's an accountant <laughs> he's like oh tough teddy the tailor huh yeah yeah he makes clothes and tough teddy comes out like i'm sorry you got something wrong with making clothes? Fine quality, custom <laughs> clothes, double breasted. I'll oh, stop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nobody's calling him They're a like, seamstress. Oh, right? I'm sorry. This time in Chicago, we're we're just off of the St. Valentine's Day massacre. Al Capone's still in charge of Chicago outfit. Bugs Moran's still hanging on to the North Side gang, and they're still at full fledged wars. And Chicago prohibition warfare was known to be the wildest spot like more than new york more than anywhere chicago was the wild west of prohibition and that was kind of right in this era and eventually as it will that violence kind of kicks over into the african-american community the brownsville neighborhood had honestly kind of policed itself through most of the time and but 1931 no brass in brownsville uh, several months of war kind of break out. You with, said 31? In 1931, yeah. Man, that's some busy two years, Teddy. No punk bitch. So uh, those numbers won't run themselves. Damn straight, man. So after this war starts to break out, uh, one of the top policy operators ends up getting murdered. And then Ed Jones, he kind of had the largest of the policy operations. He organized a big meeting at the Vicenz Hotel in Chicago, and he brought in all the top black policy operators, and they ended up coming up with a 12-man policy syndicate that they divided out. They come up with a voting program, a way to vent your issues. They divided the territory, and Ed Jones was killing it. And there was still room for other uh, other operations. So he's kind of like, well, look, I mean, these guys, all these Italians, the t- Italian and Irish are killing each other in the street. We don't got to do that. We could just split this up. Well, I mean, that mindset also, I mean, even though, like you said, the Italians are killing them, whatever, but uh, the whole getting everyone organized, that's how the mob got to what the mob is. You get all the stupid street gangs together to form the organized crime. Yeah. And that's why it's much more dangerous, much more harder to take down. I mean, yeah. strength in numbers. Well, right? I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a smaller scale version of what Lucky Lucian did with uh, you know kind of all the families. it's always crazy like where certain things like happen that change the game like this is a weird comparison but like Moneyball, like all of a sudden like we saw like oh that's how you build a baseball team so this sort of thing of like yeah we should get all the heads together and work out a syndicate and all work together it just seems like well no shit that's what you should do but at the time it was like wow yeah let's get a it was like some warrior shit can you <laughs> dig it? Right. Why should we all run different, separate numbers and, I'm sorry, policy games when we can run one, we can, you know, maybe a few less of us end up in jail because we're fighting each other. Maybe, uh, you know, a few more people can uh, make a little bit more money than they did before. Yeah. Teamwork makes the dream work. You know what I mean? This is a picture. This is the Jones brothers. This is Ed Jones all the way.
say on the left here. What, See, what's also okay is you haven't mentioned yet, but Ed Jones needs a nickname. If he's Tough Teddy, that should be Rough Eddie or oh. something like. <laughs> uh, they they call they call him Big Ed. Okay. Oh, that's I guess, not creative. I mean, is he big though? Because like like you said, like back in the day, like Tough Teddy meant some shit. You know, like Big Ed. Like if you were Big Ed and you didn't come through Big Ed, then there was probably a reason why they called you Big Ed. I only brought it up because you asked. But for one, he was called Big Ed because he wasn't big. He was more of okay. a big shot. Right you know, on. he wasn't a big guy physically, but he was like kind of Like when you call a big guy slim. Right. Tiny. And then the other one was, which actually I was just about to hit, is the syndicate appointed Ed Jones. And then there was a guy that was Big Sam Martin. So they put those two as kind of the heads of the syndicate. So it was a 12-man syndicate. Ed Jones ran the south uh, the south side. And then Big Sam Martin ran the west side. Oh, he's so, got Big Ed and Big Sam? So that's why all right, all that's right. why they dropped big pretty pretty quick. Yeah, that's, I, that's too many I, bigs. I, I, <laughs> all right, I no. submit I submit to your uh, to your understanding earlier. Yes, yes. Now, I don't know about Big Ed no more, but you know what? <laughs> I guess Big Ed came through with the big money back in twenty nine. He had the sixteen G's and he rolled it into you know the biggest uh, policy syndicate in uh, in Chicago that nobody cared about, not the cops or the big time uh, gangsters. So yeah, big I'm, ups Big Ed. <laughs> yeah, I might be tiny, but my wall is huge. <laughs> Well, and this is uh this is Big Sam Martin. Okay, so that's the guy that ran the uh he See, ran the West Side. He should be called Big Sam. Big Sam actually <laughs> looks, looks Big like, Sam. Yeah. He actually looks big. So you see why if one of them had to drop the name, it was Ed Jones that was gonna lose it. There's only one man big enough for this town. Look, and it's me. And it's Sam. It's like when uh when Tom Brady decides to leave the Patriots to come to your team. Like, look, I need your number. You're like, but, but I've had 12 my whole career. I don't care, man. He's like, Big Sam comes in like, look, man, sorry, you're not Big Ed no more. <laughs> look, you can run the syndicate, yeah. but I'm Big Sam. I'm taking your number, bro. <laughs> you know, Teddy walks up and you're like, just so you know, I'm tough Teddy. Anytime I want to be big, fucking watch it, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> on top of, you know, running the biggest operation, organizing the syndicate. Because that's not enough. On top of that. On top of that, he started to develop political connections. So he started working for the Cook County Democrat League. Leader Patrick Nash. Okay. All right. And then and what? Uh, we're still in the twenties, right? Uh, no, this is 1931. Oh yeah, I forgot we jumped. All right. So I'm just trying to get the political atmosphere because a black guy getting into politics at this time, most black voters were predominantly Republican. Okay. You know, it was the it was the party is Abraham Lincoln's party. You know what I mean? See, was, that's a big thing too. It was kind I, of pre-switch, I guess. Yeah, you could say. I was just gonna ask about that, and I hate to bring that up, but if I guess it was a thing, you know what I mean? I'm I'm not in. Well, the no, it's in the story. I, I don't know enough to cover the yeah. politics, but I know yeah. kind of the well, facts of it. Well, I mean, the rough speaking is back in, the, of course, the parties switched platforms. Like back right. in, uh, they were called the Dixiecrats is what it was, because they were Southern based. That was Lyndon Johnson. That's really where the Clintons are old school, like Dixiecrats. Yeah. That's why most people, like democratically speaking, like Clintons aren't just about Republicans. Yeah. Like they're that style of party. That's the way Lyndon B. Johnson was. That's the- Well, so what they did, the the Democratic Party, the reason they, they partnered, what the numbers policy did was they helped them out. They helped them get get the black vote. So like when they were selling policy slips, they would send out like uh, voter registrations with your policy slips. Basically, a lot of the policy <laughs> game would steer the community towards uh, democratic votes. You know, they would organize like uh, on voting day, shuttle them to and from and get them from the voting place, give, give people discounts if they could show that they voted that day and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you really are any, I mean, we hear there's a lot like Al Capone did this in his community. Uh, in Harlem, a lot of people did. If you're like a criminal within your community, normally they give back to the community. They're big in the community. And if you are going to be a community head, you might as well go into politics to get some official sway on some shit. Yeah. Especially you want to get snugged in with them politics. Because once you reach, if you're just like a street criminal, then fuck politics. It don't matter. But once you're, you got the organization or whatever, yeah. you definitely want some government officials on your side. Even right? if it's just for the little stuff, right? Like, I mean, you can't take care of all the big stuff for me, but at least get this little shit off my back. Yeah. So, I mean, really, this whole story, I mean... This is almost by the numbers, like, like the dark side of the American mm-hmm. dream. Like he started little, worked the old tailor shop. He started sweeping the broom, <laughs> just running some number. Then he went through, he started Ray crocking the franchise and getting McDonald's spread across the nation. He, and now he moved up to get into the politics and shit. Like what's Denzel's name it's, in uh American gangster? Frank, uh, Frank Lucas, Frank Lucas. Yeah. He just, I was well, thinking yeah. Joe Kennedy, like, yeah, it's kind of the Joe Kennedy story. In 1933, 
Patrick Nash's ha- uh, his handpicked candidate, Ed Kelly, gets voted into mayor. This started as called the Kelly Nash Political Machine, which became one of the most powerful and corrupt big city political organizations since Boss Tweed. Like Boss Tweed, that was like uh, Gangs of New York, like oh. that like old timey New York corruption. It's kind of that level. Boss Tweed's one of my favorite beers. <laughs> they got their political connections. They're kind of running the whole thing. The Jones Brothers, they opened a department store on 47th Street, which became the first black-owned department store in America. Um, well, that makes sense. He knows his suits. Yeah. Right? <laughs> he knows his business. He's got the, he got he's got the connections. All and shit. angles, baby. Well, I then, bet you he's the one that figured that out. He's like, you know what? I know my suits. Bet you we can slang these shits. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, what are the, I mean, we didn't really cover it, but I'm taking like the whole policy thing. Like it's perfectly legal. Like, is it gray areas? What's the legality? in? <laughs> no, it, it's illegal. It's, uh, it, it got made illegal in 1905. So by the time when Ted Rowe shows up, it had been an illegal, like for a quarter century. They've been at it for 25 years. But, but even though it was illegal, it wasn't, it was just off the radar. Nobody that's gave what I'm a saying, shit. like it's illegal, but it's, eh, it's... It makes you wonder about the lottery now. Like, is that what it evolved from? Like these guys started the lottery mm-hmm. and then like eventually, like in the 50s and 60s, they're like, all right, government, we'll cut you in for the schools. <laughs> well, I mean, that's <laughs> what it is what the government do. They, they, they see a good racket and then they just monopolize it. That's what, that's what they did with... Firemen, like firemen, used to be a private organization. We're like, no, we'll oh, take yeah. that over. Taxation like, of, of yeah. you know, prohibitions over, but we're gonna tax it. You know, lottery. Uh, they took that over. They yeah. do. They take over everything. Twenty years. Uh, this won't be so bad no more. And then we're gonna we're gonna make. I mean, that straight is what like. Well, this is a good racket. These motherfuckers are making a lot of money off this. Let's make it illegal for them and let's take it over. Like, that's what they do. I mean, it's what they did with, like, drugs. Like, no, opium's illegal. Let's put it into pill form and sell it back to them and then it's legal. Like, that's just their style. The reason why I thought of the legality is, like, is this whole department store, like, a money laundering sort of thing? I'm assuming maybe it was an attempt at it, but they they were making legit good money decisions. So, like, not just them, but all the policy kings, they would they would invest in a lot of black businesses. So they were they were on top of their – they had all this money from yeah. their, their policy shit that they're – and they would just – Yeah. They would reinvest illegal. it. So they would start a department. Yeah, so they would make money off it. It was a legit – it was a giant department store. It's, like, world famous or something. It's called uh, – uh, Benjamin Franklin's. Right? Oh, okay. That's yeah. in uh, Chicago, but yeah. someone else called it a five and dime store. But they invested in banks. Uh, you know, Provident Hospital. They did. Uh, they did that with uh, policy money. Uh, they founded Negro League baseball teams, like local entertainers. Man. See, like, man, that's cash too, man. Like yeah. Professional <clears throat> sports teams, like even See? today, you know, that's cash, man. You got. And- that's one thing that I always respect about certain criminal when they do that. Like you can say whatever, dirty money, whatever. That, and so far, it doesn't sound like. As far as bad guys go, like, so far as this guy's just a business dude, yeah. just in some illegal shit. It's a, but like, it's dirty money, kind of. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I mean when you give it back, politicians you, nowadays, when you look back in their family past, you know, there was some dirty shit going on. Yeah, out all there. money is dirty money. They got like, their power somehow. Yeah, so, but I'm just saying, like, the motherfuckers on that baseball field don't give a fuck, you know what I mean? That yeah. motherfucker that just got a bank loan, he's had right. the motherfucker that just Everybody went to who's going to the stores, you know, mm-hmm. like, by the way, we're black owned and, you know, hey, fuck that store up the street where you get the side eye you know what i mean come over mm-hmm. here grab your suit with no judgment and you know all right live your yeah, yeah do your fucking thing yeah yeah and so i just got respect i mean say whatever you want but the criminals that put it back into the community and help they're at least pretty decent dudes like i don't give up like that's pretty good okay on top of giving back to the community they kind of were also the main employer of the neighborhood they say at their height it was estimated that between six and ten thousand people were employed by the policy game. So like Ted Rowe, his operation, he had runners, writers, pickup men, station operators, collectors, bookkeepers, off worker, office workers, and secretaries. Oh yeah. So like six thousand. Yeah. Like that's fairly a criminal. Like Tough that's a gang. Yeah, this guy was just an economy. economy. Yeah, that's a job. Like you started a business. Yep. Yep. Dude, see, that was one hell of a move. Imagine if he just stayed in Little Rock. Oh yeah. yeah. Like bootlegging like bootlegging and fist fighting i don't know though i'm gonna give teddy his due and say if he stayed in little rock he'd be the al capone of little rock yeah but they probably <laughs> would have found some shit going he'd there be running the shit out of everything in little rock but huh? there were no policy like he didn't get into policies or nothing he went right. up north like he didn't that know was a none skill of that he learned up yeah. north yeah i got you there he probably would have stuck with bootlegging yeah, there was no tail there was right. no tailoring syndicate down in little rock <laughs> right, right. <laughs> 
what's up with his old lady? He's still like married to her. Everything's cool with that. Yeah. For the rest of his for the rest of his life, he was yep. tough. Right. To, yeah, because no, he came up right. He met. He met her in. The, no, no. Yeah, he, he met, met her in Arkansas. Arkansas. He, That's yeah, where he went. Rock. He went straight and fucking. Okay. All right. All right. So she probably was like, "Hey, I seen him give it a shot. We tried. We went to Detroit. Got yeah. A job at the I mean, plant. did that he go bitch. straight or was he just the main bootlegging dude for that auto factory? You know. But right. either way, yeah. either way, you know. You it's funny because you guys already hit on this as you're saying it, and I knew this co- quote was coming up, but there's a, a famous author, his name was Richard Wright. He said, they would have been steel tycoons, Wall Street brokers, and auto moguls had they been white. All right. Yeah. So they're just... And you know what? I believe it. Be in, but you know what? On the same token, though, they kind of, I mean, they kind of were the, the moguls of that community. So either way, you know, maybe they didn't get to that, that height of riches, but, you know, they, were, they, weren't, they weren't slouching that time. I mean, if they're running that many businesses, they got that many employees, you you know, Tough Teddy, uh, both bigs, and everybody else <laughs> in the big crew is not living yeah. living tough, right? All right. Well, on that note, we're going to take us a little, uh, a little refill break, a little drain the main vein, and we'll be back momentarily. listening just real quick want to ask you to subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app go to apple itunes give us a five-star rating and leave us a review and we'll read it on the show if you have any questions comments or a guy that you would recommend we cover you can email us at say hello to the bad guy podcast at gmail.com we also want to thank six Fo sueno for letting us use his music in the intro you can subscribe to him on youtube and also a friend of the show cancer He's got an art, photography, and graphic design page at Eyes Bleed Defiance on Instagram. You can see a lot of his work, including our cover art, which he designed. And he also performed the mid-show song, Blood, from his album, Grenades, Pistols, and Rape Whistles. Now back to the show. And we're back! <laughs> we're, uh, we last left off, uh, he was getting into politics, they just opened up their, uh, department store and uh the up and coming of uh tough teddy yeah there's just business businessman in their way through this underworld so by this point ted Rowe is the top lieutenant and he's running all the day-to-day operations ed jones didn't want to have to worry about the uh robberies and kidnap attempts police raids federal investigations it was still a criminal organization he's trying to get nucky thompson At the yeah. end, <laughs> at the end, like I need to get into the politics side and be a little cleaner. You gotta handle the business. Ted Rowe at the time, he was described as tall, scrappy, and not scared of shit. People called him the baddest man to ever walk the south side of Chicago. When you said the size and he's tough Teddy, we don't really get the toughness, but I bet you there's plenty of stories of him fucking people up throughout the years, but that sort of shit, like, doesn't make Wikipedia. They're not going to talk about all the times he beat people up, how intimidating he was, like, every interaction. But I assume him running numbers throughout the year, even though it's not on the books, he wasn't hired muscle, I'm sure he's had to fuck plenty of people up throughout the years. When you're a bootlegger and they say he could back it up with his fist, you can go ahead and credit that to like 30 fights right there because you don't get in a fist fight or two and now all of a sudden you got a reputation as a tough guy. You got to <laughs> yeah. be whooping a lot of ass before they start saying, hey, uh, Ted Rowe, just leave him be. 
He's going to beat your ass, right? And then you move to Chicago, and now you're running the top operation, and people are like, oh, he's tall and scrappy and ain't scared of shit. Well, they don't say that because they haven't seen it. Well, when you're running fucking opening department stores and fucking buying up political parties, you don't got to talk about that time you smack that dude in line at the place. <laughs> yeah. like, that's, right. that's like a my level crime. Like, <laughs> he's, do- he's doing real shit. In 1938, Time Magazine called Bronzeville the center of black business in the United States. The Jones brothers owned property in Paris and Mexico, and by that time were making about $10,000 a day. Okay. Damn. Wow. That's impressive. Time Magazine. Because, I mean, you know, this 38 magazines are, I mean, that's the one of the top forms of media at the time. You know yeah. what I mean? That was the that was the Wikipedia of yeah. 1938. And, I Time mean, Magazine. you know, it's like, you know, hey, your your reputation could do something for you back then. So if you're going to be thrown in the Time Magazine back then, then you're damn straight owning property in foreign countries and acting like a jet setter and, and making 10 G's a day. 10 G's 1938 cash a day. It's big, it's big fucking money. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's big money today. So it's for sure big money. Then. <laughs> 10 grand a day. So even though they controlled a lot of the local politics, you know, local government, eventually the federal government came sniffing around. And in 1941, Ed Jones pled guilty and basically took the rap for all the brothers and pled no guilty to shit. Pled guilty to tax evasion. Damn. Well, and it basically came down to, well, someone's going down. And he was like, well... And I, I guess he's kind of been running the family since the beginning, so it makes sense that he'd be the one to step up. He gets his big title back. You're big Ed again, Ed. <laughs> well, and I mean, depending on where he does get locked up, if he gets locked up around his area, he's probably living like when the Goodfellas got locked up. Like, he's in there slicing garlic with a razor blade, you know what I mean? Back off of what I said just before, before that, this guy was on fucking Time Magazine. So, I mean, just like now, you know, somebody that high profile goes to prison, chances are, I mean, I'm just saying, you probably got enough cash to make it cushy, but still, I just to me, like any prison, I just say props, but st- I, I'm, I'm with you, man. Yeah, he's definitely got some commissary money. That's for sure. (laughs) Yeah. He's getting all the ramen noodles. He got sent to prison in Terre Haute, Indiana. I mean, that's kind of his neck of the woods. They run Indiana, too. And then around the same time when he went to prison, his brother Mac died in a car accident. Oh, damn. So with uh, Mac dead and Ed Jones in federal prison, Ted Rowe became a partner in the business. And then he became a non-voting member of the syndicate hierarchy. So he was in the syndicate. Like He was there to say his piece, but he didn't have a vote yet. Okay. He was like Anakin being on the council, but he wasn't a master Jedi. <laughs> I, I feel like he'd be less whiny than Anakin. I hope. I really hope. Oh, big guy got locked up. No! <laughs> uh, Ted Rowe was like a real man of the people. They loved him. He was known to pay hospital and funeral bills for people that couldn't afford it. There was a, a Reverend Clarence Cobb. He said that he could always count on Ted Rowe when if, if I needed help to feed or clothe the poor. Damn. It should have been say hello to the good guy. <laughs> right. Like, when it comes DEFCON, this guy's like negative five. Like he owes DEFCONs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you traded too many DEFCONs for hospital bills, Teddy. Well, there's one time as an elderly lady, she uh, hit the numbers with a like an independent Italian operation and wouldn't pay her up. So they complained yeah. to Ted and he said he personally go get the money. But when he went, he wouldn't take the money from the guy, but he escorted the guy to the lady to make him pay her. The so. G way. And damn, the like G every way. time, like I keep on just waiting for a chance to jump in, but everything you're saying is like, all right, so <laughs> good dude. <laughs> like Even when he's like, we'll go get this fucking money. Now you pay the nice lady. Yeah. Yeah. Like this dude. But like, you know, that's the, that's the <laughs> romantic oh, I mean, I mean, you know, I'm stuck on the, is this guy a good guy? Is he a bad guy? Movie style gangster, you know? I mean, there's always, I'm, I think there's something coming up because there's always well, something, right? The thing is, so far, we haven't seen old Teddy face adversary at Whoa, why can right. I can't fucking say adversity? Swarthy. Yes, yeah. swarthy. I, I couldn't say bootlegging earlier. Like, he's got his, so, yeah, you're right. He's got his tailor in the fall back on. But, he's always been, I mean, even though he's non voting, he's highly made. Yeah, and he's in criminal point. shit, but they haven't been in the streets criminal. Like, yeah, maybe there's a term we don't see. Maybe he since, does. Uh, since uh, Little Rock, right? Yeah, because so far, I'm not like. He ran some policy, which is like illegal, whatever. Selling weed was illegal till it wasn't. So, well, a, a quote that I read about him, it said he was more a racketeer than a gangster and he was more a hustler than a thug. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
So did you say that quote earlier? No. Hey. Okay. That's a motherfucking like no, P. Diddy he, lyric. He dropped, he dropped a couple quotes, and I was like, dude, is your memory this bad to where you don't remember these quotes with your notepad? So when Ed Jones was in prison, he met a guy named Sam Giancana. Pretty gangstery mob name. Any mob aficionados be like, oh, Sam Giancana. Oh, wow. That looks like. A... <laughs> sorry, I was just saying that looks like a movie scripted. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, movie cast gangster right there. <laughs> People that are like mob aficionados hear this and they say, oh, he met Sam Giancana. Yeah, that mob boss. No, he met, this is Sam Mooney Giancana. His nickname was Momo. He was like, a. it's him eventually. But at this point, he's just kind of a, a low level mob associate. So this is like pre big shot. All right. So at this point, they're in prison together. He's a low level mobster. He's trying to work his way up in the mob. Prohibition was the heyday of the mafia. It was a cash cow. Yeah. And now they're kind of trying to come up with new rackets. For some reason, while Ed Jones is in prison, he decides to kind of break down the policy racket and how it works to Sam Giancana. And some people say he was trying to expand into different neighborhoods or that he thought it would be helpful to have mob connections. But it seems like he probably just wanted to have a mob friend in prison. Like Which it probably seems, is not yeah. a bad thing, right? Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, all those is probably a combination of all of those things. You know what I mean? That all seems like that would... If you're in prison with a mob guy and you know a racket and you know he's looking for a racket, hey, do I we got know an idea how long, for you. Uh, Big Ed, sorry, do we know how long Big Ed was in prison for at that time? Uh, was he, he like for like, for it was it? Like he was going to live there for the rest no, of his life? No, he only, he, he only did a couple years. So he was okay, out, he, so, he so, went in in 1941, he was out by 1943. Oh, okay, yeah. so you definitely need to keep networking then because I mean, you're Big Ed, you don't want this to be the end, you got to keep moving, make make new connections. So Like Sam Giancana thinks it's cool, but like, nobody really trusted these black businesses you know they just really thought of it as low like when you when you're explaining to them oh you could take a penny or a nickel no way. old school italian did it didn't it uh respect the black man yeah oh, uh, oddly get enough out of here but he but he was anxious to make a move so ed jones gets out and he tells his guys and ted rose like hey you really want to stay away from these italian dudes like he didn't like it yeah he didn't like the outfit guys he thought they had a good setup how they had it oh well then and, i said my thing it probably definitely indeed. was he just wanted a friend in jail then like and, why would you tell that dude your racket if you're gonna get out of prison and be like hey stay away from these guys i don't want them doing our shit well no ed jones made friends with him when he got out ted rowe yeah didn't oh like, okay yeah, yeah, yeah. ted rowe didn't like that they were kind of working with the like that he'd been hanging oh, out with the mob right. guys oh, I got you. i'm solid on ted's theory too yeah so am just I. from a business standpoint you know oh i'm sorry GM, did your market just dry up? Well, here, have some of ours. We're Ford. Like, you can have a... Here, do you take the Mustang? Like, no, fuck that, man. So like, your your prohibition dried up? Sorry for you, dude. We've been running legit businesses, running numbers, and sorry for your fucking loss, but uh, I ain't trying to bring you in. I'm tough, Ted, and we've been running a decent gig. You know, Ed, what the shit, man? You were big Ed in prison, now your big is gone again. <laughs> well, and I mean... <laughs> We're talking about the fucking, like I said, the Italians, very racist people. Expe I mean, back then, at least, like, definitely. So, why would, as a black man, as, uh, like, Time Fresh Magazine's prison, top maybe? entrepreneurs, like, why would you be wanting to give this yeah. guy your shit? Why would you want to work with them at all? Like, yeah, I got Ted's, uh back on this one like dude we're making 10 grand a day yeah these broke motherfuckers are just wanting to rat why would we work with them fuck them well and it's the oddest thing in the story like i'm telling you i researched the shit out of this and that's the one thing in the whole story that nobody has an idea on somebody why got the fuck got why him, the right? fuck he just started telling them about his numbers business yeah, his big guy got a yeah, wife first... he got kids they get at him in prison they fucking put some pressure on him yeah i mean now i'm on microphone like i was like yeah why wouldn't you tell them they're looking but like yeah that that is is dumb now that I think about it. Like, yeah, why the fuck would... No, and I agreed with Big Ed in prison. Like, well, Big Ed's looking at the future, but I... then after when I got out and I heard Ted's side, I was like, nah, bro. You know, this ain't... I... I think it would have to be a he needed Ed's help or he needed just homeboys. stay safe in prison. Yeah, yeah that's... The only thing, but, or mean, they were just how, hanging out. Was it and he the was reverse dumb. of now, fellas? I mean, back in the day, do we know the prison population? Was there more white people in prison than there? You know, like now, it's predominantly uh, minorities. Is it was back then? Was it predominantly? Well, because who knows? Because that's a federal prison. That's ho housing mobsters and tax evaders. So that might have been a different demographic. Yeah, to where... he might have been the only <laughs> dude. You know, there. And Ed, Ed Jones might have been better off in a worse prison. Yep. And who owns the guards? Right. Oh that's yeah. 
yeah, little piece there of you it. are there because yep you know because even though they're 10 grand a day maybe prohibition had been making 100 grand a day yeah. and brought in more protection and life you. probably is a lot better for a tiny mobster in prison than a black man in prison and jones gets out before sam giancana does and sam kind of has his guys he's like well hey check this guy out and see what he's about and they they go check and they're like dude he never wears the same suit twice you know he drives nice cars he lives in a mansion like this guy is really making money 1946 sam giancana gets released from prison two months later on may 11th 1946 sam giancana and his guys kidnap and joe ed jones and hold him for ransom okay <laughs> so god way to prove teddy wrong <laughs> ed jones got out and you said 43 yes so you're man what the fuck did giancana have over ed he got out three years later and he's still the, like wait man i had a three-year head start on you bro <laughs> and you still got the power over me you just fucking and kidnapping me like I ain't shit, like I wasn't on time, motherfucking magazine. <laughs> Goddamn. Some shit went down in the showers in that Dude, prison. I don't know right? what. Somebody, like, had somebody's cornbread. Sam Giancana puts him up for ransom and s- says, you give us 250 grand, we'll give you back. No problems, no questions asked. Even though 40's big time cash. Ted, Ted. <laughs> He's like, man, that's like... Sh- 25 days <laughs> <laughs> well uh, that's that's the math ted road does and he grabs a quarter million dollars and shows up and gets his boy out oh all right God yeah. damn, like that's some sweet shit like oh a quarter million all right fuck i guess we'll have to do it like, he's like dude somebody asked me for a quarter million and be like well fuck, mm-hmm. i guess you're gonna have to kill him like, i mean you're my boy and shit but i ain't, ain't got that. big ed gets in the ride mm-hmm. tough ted's like don't fucking say a goddamn word <laughs> and fucking big ed's just looking out the window like when you were a teenager and your mom was mad at you Quarter million, Ted. Ted's not mad. He's just disappointed. (laughs) (laughs) uh, Look, are we going to learn from this? Is the is the real is the real question? So Sam Giancana says they come up with a quarter million dollars like that. That means there's money in the numbers game. So we're going to take that shit over. He tells them, you're going to kick the racket, the, the 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 policy game over to us. And Ed Jones, within three days of getting released, he packed up and him and his brother and his fa- and their families moved to Mexico and retired. Yeah. And they left the business to Ted. It's about mm-hmm. time. And, and Ted's got the, he's got the wisdom. He's got the, you know, he's got the brains. He's, he's the one who should be calling the shots at that point. <laughs> he's got the right stuff. <laughs> They hand over the whole operation to Ted. Ted refuses to sell to the Italians. Shocker. Damn straight, man. <laughs> yeah. Finally, dude. See, now this is I'm hoping what comes after this is like this the steep rise of of like the the violence that Ted was like, you know what? I've been holding it back. I've been trying to do it the right way, but you guys keep on trying to buy me out. Fucking here's tough Ted. <laughs> God damn. Tanks ready to go to war. Right? <laughs> Cause I like his style, man. Right? You don't I pull like that bullshit style, on man. fucking Ted. I ain't fucking doing this shit right. Right for a long motherfucking time, baby. <laughs> Tough Teddy gonna have to choke a bitch. <laughs> He, he restabilizes the organization. He brings in a, a longtime crew member, Cliff Davis, who's the guy he kind of came up with. So him and Cliff Davis stabilized the operation like they're the new bosses in town. Ted sets up his own new political ne- connection with a guy named William Dawson. And William Dawson was important because he had connections with the, the FOP. The Fraternal Order of Police. Oh, okay. Yeah. Once you get the police on your side, that's in the Fraternal Order. Man, that's like you know what I mean. Like, there's some brotherhoods out there, right? But you gotta imagine. I don't know for sure, mm. but you gotta imagine the Brotherhood of Police is a tight. <laughs> it's a frat and police and it's, together. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's like a megazord <laughs> of just brotherly of shit loyalty. you don't want to be getting involved yeah. with. It's the same shit, like right, like well, he's a made man. I mean, there's not a lot I could say. He's like, well, he's a he's a brother of the police. Yeah. I mean, that you gotta let him fucking. You, uh, you gotta let him fucking chew his own foot off a little bit before we get at him. Yeah, you know? he's but, part of the fuzz frat. Yeah. You don't fuck with him. You don't fuck with the fuzz frat. So the FOP, that helped, I mean, for one, obviously, because you got connections in law enforcement, so they would cut you some slack. But they always had plenty of operating room. What really helped him on that was for security. When he refused to sell to the Italians, it sparked a, a six-year war. That's got to so, be, right? So we're going to six-year well, war. they made an offer, he couldn't refuse, and he refused. And they're like, <laughs> yeah. what? We, you can't. Have you seen any this. of the movies, yeah. Ted? I'm sorry, did you forget Capone? <laughs> the guy's past that uh, time. Run that back Tough to me. Uh, what was that yeah. now? He would use the FOP. He would get access to, so most of his security would be off-duty police officers. And then a lot of his other security, by now, we had a lot of guys in the neighborhood that had went to World War II and got trained in and couldn't find work. So he had considerably higher-end security 
than a lot of the other criminals did. For one, he paid well, so they liked him. You know, people looked up to him. And but just higher quality. You know, yeah. he had a lot of guys, a lot of trained soldiers and police officers as a security. I mean, so could, he was hard to get to. Well, cool. and when it comes to like military sort of people and police are in that same thing, like they respond to good leadership. It has always had his shit together. On September 11th, 1946, uh, one of the South Side Numbers chiefs, a guy named Robert Wilcox, he was a confidant of Ted Rowe, like they were homies. They're both from the South Side, and he got shot in his policy house April 23rd and on April 28th. So five days apart, 1947, Leo Benvenuto and Cesar Benvenuto, who were Italian policy operators, both had their houses blown up. Damn, then, thank you got your wish. Hey, you know Shit's, what, man? Shit just got real. People stopped being polite and started getting real. Right, he just redlines it, apparently. Like, I've just been fist fighting this whole time. You know what? Just just blow their house up. And and, and this is this is now we're, we're in the late 40s, you said? 1947. So 1898, 47. We're talking about 49 years. So he's he's getting a point in his life where you don't fuck with an old man right <laughs> like because you don't know what old man's gonna do you right. know what i mean and back then 49 and probably i mean don't get me wrong if you had cash probably it's 49 nowadays but some of them pictures you see of a 49 year old motherfucker from back in the 40s he looks like he's 69 so teddy he <laughs> might have been at the point in his life where he just stopped giving a shit but like i said he did it right for a long time and his back was you know hey he tried to buy us out Nope, that shit ain't happening. Now we need to fight fire with fire. He ain't got time to play no games. Yep. Now, uh, June 19th, 1948, the Gary, Indiana policy boss, uh, Lewis Buddy Hutchin, was shot and killed. Teddy Rowe ended up inheriting his share of the business. Uh, everybody else, they pretty much just retired and set up shop. <laughs> so he, he kind of took that over. And then on November 15th, 1950, uh, Big John Martin got shot with a shotgun sitting in his Cadillac. Now, he lived, but he retired and left Chicago and left the whole west side operation to ted Rowe too well, one of teddy rose guys got killed two guys got their house blown up when they kill like the outside guys they just kind of donate their business over to ted like ah fuck it like so basically just everybody was bowing out like everything like, <laughs> like shit's getting like, blown up we yeah. get shot we out of here man come on come on tough teddy i <laughs> thought we was acting tough but playing straight right. now you're getting bowed at we just i don't know what's going on i man. bought a hospital we were opening department stores and shit teddy Benjamin <laughs> franklin's baby five and dime and now it's real <laughs> Okay, so Sam G and kind of decides, you know, they always say, like, you have to stick or the carrot, and clearly the fight couldn't work because he just couldn't, he wasn't winning. <laughs> so he tried to go with the carrot. They set up a sit down at the Boogie Woogie Bar, which is a bar that was owned by Sam G and Kana. <laughs> okay. And, and named by his four year old daughter. Better not be a fucking setup. <laughs> <laughs> well, after after the, the boogie woogie booby trap. I mean, so what Sam Giancana said was, look, we don't got to go to war and I'm not trying to take over your business. I need a face in Bronzeville anyways. I'm not going to go in there and try and run the business. So you just go ahead and keep your business and run it. And then you just kick us up a percentage of everything you make. So it's, <laughs> hey, we're going to pretty much do the classic Italian mob thing of, hey, you just do what you normally do. And just, and give, us just some. give us money yeah. like, so that we let you do what you just normally do. So in public in a bar, and this is a big deal because, you know, like made guys, you're not supposed to, you know, do like you don't put your hands on them. You don't fight them and shit. So Ted Rowe and Sam Gian kind of got in a fight in the bar when, <laughs> <laughs> when after a sit down. So we offered them. OK, so we offered them to take over the business. And Ted Rowe said, I'd rather die first. And Sam Giancana said, so, well, my friend, you just might. Okay. Ooh, and Ted Rowe beat the shit bird. out of him. Now, you know what, man? Hell yeah, he's like, yeah. you a made man? I'm a tailor made man. <laughs> Fuck him up. Damn straight, dude. Damn straight. Cause Ted Rowe don't play no shit. Up, hey, I thought it was going to be a setup, and it, it that was a pleasant surprise. Well, they couldn't set him up. Uh, Ted Rowe had, had better security. You, you sure. did say that. You did say. And, you know, so that's what, when you said that, they're like, oh, we're going to let you. And, you know, that's what I thought. Like, wait, was that really the mob's weak moment of saying, we're going to let you? It was like, that was the, you got a pair of twos, and somebody else got 
fucking a full house and you're like all in <laughs> <laughs> like wait back back up a second dude we got the power here what do you mean you're gonna let me I i'd mean, rather die first i mean it was just a way of them just repositioning the same argument because what they basically wanted was just a piece of their racket so yeah, they're yeah. just like hey well we said give it to us what we really mean is just give us some of it Damn, like well that's the same thing quick <laughs> puncher bro you're a quick punch you jab me a, a bunch <laughs> like you, you, you guys want to stop fighting now well it's just so crazy that it's like the mob wanted to do what they're doing and then Ty's like, no, we're not going to do that. So they start killing each other. Shit pops up. All right, let's have a sit down to sell the, to settle this. Hey, we still want what we said we wanted. <laughs> like, the you know, fuck? That's you know, how the city was like, wait, you should be paying me, dude. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm missing the part here. Like, <laughs> right, yeah, that's the same thing. That's exactly <laughs> what we're fighting about. I'm we can't just I be in the, the middle. <laughs> like, time out, time out, time out. No, still fuck you. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> I promise I won't fight. I won't defend myself anymore. And then yeah, once you let him up, he just starts swinging again. Hey, yeah, we want you to pay us. Big old fight, big old fight. Wait, wait, wait. All right, let's stop fighting. <laughs> we just want you to pay us. <laughs> Ted, uh, Ted Rowe, at one point, he got uh, ambushed at a Boston, uh, the Boston club. Remember we talked about earlier, at this point, he's like 49 years old. Yeah. He got in like a Michael Bay style uh, car chase where he bounced out <laughs> on his car, crashed his car, and then ran away. Oh, damn. He's like Danny Glover and mel gibson and lethal weapon like he's too old for this shit but he's still getting into right. the action he's still Every, navy sealing like yeah. just when you think he doesn't have that next angle covered he's like yep i do yep uh, i do it's like gonna... i got skills with my hands <laughs> i can I, I took care of the syndicate while big ed was in prison he's out i just i fucking showed him the way and retired his ass and then after that i'm crashing cars i'm beating motherfuckers up when i'm 50 like could you imagine i couldn't fight like if i was to fight a dude right now i'd probably die of a heart attack and like afterwards seconds, shortly you know, after I mean, he's 50, bro. He's like 14 mm. years old. He's 50 and he's running. Yeah. <laughs> he's running anywhere. Like running away from something. Oh, you just caught me. I don't sorry, know. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> like, I'm me. romancing slightly, but <laughs> fucking Tough Teddy's the man. So That's far. why you're not Tough Tank. That's that <laughs> yes. So Sam G kind of says we got to stop fucking around and we just got to kill this motherfucker. So I'm done. <laughs> no so, playing games with this guy. He's so he, blown us up and smacked me around. So he, put, <laughs> so he puts out a hit crew. But the problem is he's always rolling with, uh, he's got a security guard, like a personal bodyguard. Like he's always got a cop with him at all time. On June 19th, 1951, he got pulled over. And then four guys, they came up and they were saying they were state's attorney police. He kept telling them, well, show me ID. How do I know? How do I know? And then they opened up his door and it turned into a fight. Like basically they're just trying to, they started dragging him out of the car. So they started fighting, and then one of the guys went to pull a gun on him. So Ted Rose quote is, he says, Then I saw a gun, so I came out with mine, and we started popping real good. If they want to come over <laughs> here and get me, I'm taking some of them with me. So. Right on. Man, and that was the birth of And rap. that was a quote, so you know he made it through, right? Well, that's a quote in court. Okay. It's, it's for real. <laughs> like a gangster-ass <laughs> quote. Oh, like, yeah. hey, Judge, can I have a second? He's like, just one second, mm -hmm. young man. I just like how he said, I seen him go for his gun, so I pulled mine, and we started popping real good. We like, started popping, popping real, real good. good. Like, and that's then I believe he's a hell of a gunfight, bro. straight, bro. <laughs> well, then I believe the next line was a nice little rhyme. Like, what, he, he was spitting that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. What was it? Uh... Oh yeah, he said if uh, if they want to come over and get hit, if if they want to come over here and get me, I'm taking some of them with me. Yeah, oh well, yeah, that's like a Tupac lyric. <laughs> Don't like, get me wrong, me with me is you know I'm sure like not you know looked great upon in the rap community, but you people know, are rapping much worse. It's Fifty one, you know, no, no, it's not the me, it's the get me and whip me. You're right. Oh, yeah. There you go. That's that syllable, right? That's yeah? it. That's it. Syllabalic. But yeah, oh. this motherfucker like. He ain't afraid to get that suit ripped, cause he'll <laughs> stitch it right up himself. Another oh, another patch on the on the shoulder though, bro. Uh, Freestyling in the courtroom. In the shootout, uh, Ted Rose shoots and kills Leonard Fat Lenny Caffiano. Fat Lenny was not only a made man, but he was the brother of Capo Marcelo Caffiano, who was a Chicago guy in Vegas at the time, and he was the godfather of Sam Giancana's daughter. Another guy was shot, but escaped the scene, and Ted Rowe testified that the police officer that was with him never pulled his gun or took a shot. Most people say it was probably a shootout, and he just didn't want to say anything to implicate the dude that was with him. Yeah, because that's how I, tough Teddy rolls, man. Well, I mean, we went through the whole fraternity or brothers thing with the police like he has their back or like they got his back or whatever he's definitely not gonna like snitch on the police 
definitely like that would be the worst move he could pop- right. possibly that, make. That's like, what's kind of right. separating them from motherfuckers right yeah, now. Yeah, that's remember when from, the mob gets them. Like, from from our from from Little Rock days, man. The cops were like, "Hey, Tough Teddy, you all right, man? Just <laughs> just keep it in your lane, and you'll yeah. be straight. Just dude. be cool, dude. That's it. You know. So it's like, and and you know who's winning? Like the mob was like, oh, "I'm sorry, we can't get at it." No, I'm, that's not how the mob sounds. But that's how they look to me in this <laughs> eyes because Tough Teddy's dominating him. He's like, "I'm sorry, we can't get at Tough Teddy's." got a cop with him like bitch you don't got cops you're the mob motherfucker <laughs> right. like who's yeah. winning here it definitely ain't you and that's exactly it. like the mob will do hits on all sorts of people but they won't start killing police right like that's when you get fucked up he was arrested immediately and charged with the murder of leonard caffiano six days later on june 25th they also added charges of conspiracy to violate illinois state anti-gambling statute so they okay. just figured Throw the book at him. yeah we got him let's just hit him with, hit him with the whammy and get both of them yeah double whammy he was not only did he kill like a high profile mobster but he was also still even with all his connections he was still a black dude that yeah. killed, killed a white guy in the 40s and shit that's what it all breaks down to. like you just said with all the connections it's still just breaks down to that yeah. uh he was serving his time in a cook county correction center under heavy security and the security was so heavy that they would they make were his, known as big security would they, they'd make his <laughs> they'd make his meals off site and bring them to him oh, because okay. they were too afraid that uh that he'd get poisoned damn damn so that just kind of gets like the gravity of that you know what i mean like not only are you're putting up stores you're employing the community and you still can't get away with I mean, I'm, I know what I'm asking for is, is 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 out of bounds, but you can't get away with whacking a fucking mobster, man. You know what I mean? Like, you just did yeah. the cops a favor. Like, he was rolling with you in your ride. He seemed like, yep, these motherfuckers want trouble and you don't. And you whack them and they're like, well, I'm sorry, though, bro. I got to send you to jail, motherfucker. And by the way, we're going to charge you with all the racketeering we didn't give a shit about for the last 30 years. <laughs> well, we know? were just sitting on that. But while yeah. you're here, fuck it. We just got to gotta hit well, you. I mean, with even though we had, like, the cops and his shit, like the attorneys the judges like the actual judicial system probably was trying to nail him right like for years like yeah you're right they didn't never have the high, his back. yeah it's always like the low end yeah. guys right that are because yep, the dudes like, on the street the they got his back but like yep. the u.s attorney and shit like he's trying to win cases and yeah you got he this, wants to get a promotion to you that got next this level. big guy that's been on time magazine of it like that's a big high level shit Get him taken off the you streets. strutting around on the magazine? Well, now you're in jail. Uh-huh. So Ted Rowe puts together the original dream team of lawyers. Before OJ <laughs> come up with the idea, Ted Rowe put him together a superstar cast. And what they did was, on the anti-gambling, they were able to tie the prosecutors to the Chicago outfit, which got some of the key evidence thrown out. They had to drop the charges <laughs> on the anti-gambling. And then he got off on the Fat Lenny murder on self-defense. He got off of both charges, and he told reporters on the on the court stairs, he told them they'd have to kill me to take me. Did the cop Damn. Did the cop return the favor? This is what I need to find out. After the show, I'm going to do research. <laughs> did the cop testify for uh, Tough Teddy like Tough Teddy hooked him up? That's what I want to know. I mean, maybe he got off. <laughs> he so they had to have. have. So maybe uh, at the very least, probably maintained being his security, like stayed with him. Well, I mean, I didn't think about it, but yeah, he got off on self defense, so that <laughs> might have been a testimony <laughs> yeah, that's there. If you got yeah, to call officer. some witnesses, yeah. yeah. Police officers who are accusing me, ask this police officer. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> so afterwards, he went to the mob. He said, "Did that go how you thought it was gonna?" <laughs> 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 your boy, Fat Lenny. I said, "What's up?" Did that go as planned? So Sam. Sam Giancana took a different approach. Once he got out of prison, Ted Rowe was pretty much untouchable. He had a he had a place. Uh, everybody knew where he lived, but he had so much security, nobody could really fuck with him. So Sam Giancana just kind of went into the neighborhoods and just started beating up the like the frontline employees. So like runners and shit. Sometimes that's kids. So they would they would go on like it's funny to hear the term blackjacks. Remember blackjacks? So they just go in the neighborhoods beating all the kids with a black, you know, like uh, just anybody they found in the operation. So since they couldn't get to him, what they figured is well, we can just go to the neighborhood and just beat the shit out of anybody that works for you. Well, I mean, that is classic rule i mean that's what you do when you go to war if you can't get onto the base you it's a, it's kill a, all the guys outside the base they're just table turning situation for the the italian mob you know earlier in ted's career ah you can have that small time shit now teddy's on top say ah, i'm untouchable and uh you know what i'm probably not gonna like you taking out my lower level guys either so keep on doing that and i'm gonna get tougher So on August 14th, 1952, Ted Rose sent his security home, put on his favorite suit, and left his house. 
at 10 p.m. at 5239 South Michigan, he was shot five times with a shotgun. He died in front of a tree that's still there today. Okay. Where the fuck was his security? He sent him home. He sent him home. This what? was his time. He was like, you know what? I'm not doing it, right? You said 50, 55? Uh, this would be... 52. 52. Oh, damn. So only a couple years. All right. So 52, he'd be, what, that'd make him, what, 54 years old? Man, that was a... That was a crazy five years, man, from... I guess he really went full Danny Glover. He's just too old for this shit. Well, you know, but five years straight, he he held him back. Not only that, Flourish beat some chart. I'm I'm still thinking... But that's great, because it still seemed like everything was going... Uh, I mean, he was... Yeah, there. Right, everything and he said was untouchable, good. That's, right? But yeah, he was taking out the... weird. The, you know what I think, though, is, you know, like he said, he's taking out the lower levels, and Ted's like, look, man, I can't protect all these guys. What am I going to do? I'm not marking out. We're not joining up, so... I'm, you know, like Big Ed before me. I'm going to fall on the sword. I'm going to send myself to the, the big prison, you know? So, my, now maybe that's... No, I got you. It's a, it's a good DC pre-guess. You know, you got to throw out the pre-guess. So the next day, the newspaper articles and uh, like the Barkers led with the title, The King is Dead. He had an 81 car procession and thousands of people lined up to watch his funeral. Uh, a lot of people say that uh, Bronzeville died the day that Ted Rowe died. After he died, he was the last of the policy kings to stand up to the mob. After he was gone, the mob just took in and took over the racket. And the first thing they did is, for one, they weren't as adverse to the violence. You know how they kind of did a syndicate to eliminate the violence? They were pro-violence. But they also took a different business approach where they didn't believe in dumping a lot of money into employees and shit. So most of those jobs, they thought, well, that's just extra, you know, we need to cut the costs. That's over. Make more well, money. Yeah. yeah let's, so let's see, trim the this bo- is the thing and you, and I don't get is, like, when you say kill it, like... To save your pit, like you're not because yeah. this was going to happen. They may not have stopped hitting them with the blackjack, but like financially, yeah, they did. Like they took out all those jobs. Like you're not saving any of your people. You're not preserving anything by just going out like that. Did you groom That's anybody, such a weird, Teddy? If you were gonna do that, you at least make a deal. Like, all right, I'll give you this racket, but you stay out of our. You make sure. These people stay in place. You work out a deal. I'm just going out there. And what's the point of being a martyr when, like, in the end, you died for nothing? Yeah, I'm like, with you yeah. there. Yeah, it didn't even work. It did, yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, at the end, like, you, like he's, it, they swept in. Yeah, conquered. you didn't make a bargain for yourself for your people or whatever. Like, you just went out, and now they took over your shit. He's and, still married. Yeah. And I'm wondering if they just fucking, like, just like Ed in prison if they started getting at him you know what i mean like look we're gonna get at your wife we're gonna get at even if he's got kids yeah but if he but was an untouched like she probably had security unsaid. constantly around her that's uns- right that's gonna happen i'm with you and like i said even if you are then make a deal for you because everybody like the second he died yeah they're gonna march in and take over your shit and they're probably not gonna run as good as you did like so maybe i wanted something from teddy that he didn't want for himself Maybe he's like, I did it for five years, <laughs> and I can't, I can't do it no well, more. Well, he technically did it for twenty something years, right? Like the well, the, I meant like the, the, the like war feuding with the That's was a, it twenty? Well, I mean, he started in twenty nine. No, I meant like the the straight up war though. Oh. Like, after, well, that was six years. So yeah, that was yeah, like four from like forty six. But but it was a tough six years though. I mean, I'm not saying, but I was. That's what I meant. Like, I gave it six years few because before then he didn't want to fight. He didn't like he didn't want to join with them. He yeah, didn't. But un- I mean, but, he beat the charges and he proved he was untouchable. And he had like I don't know. I just don't understand. There had to have been like something personal that wasn't. That's such a weird thing to just go out like yeah. that. Yeah, it was extremely personal. So if I, it turns out that his doctor diagnosed him with stomach cancer Uh, so he had terminal cancer and it gave him months to live Oh, all right. See, now that makes more sense. 50s cancer, too. 50s cancer. (laughs) Before all the lasers and fucking plutonium and shit. Yeah, yeah, that's... I'm reading this, um, I'm reading the article that we got up on the screen, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I want to highlight... People in outside, inside and outside Church of Deliverance were called the generous cutoff who handed out $50 bills to the poor as though blank streetcar transfers. So basically <laughs> what it says is at my man's funeral, $17,000 funeral for uh, for Tough Teddy in the 50, 17 grand <laughs> funeral. Uh, they're giving out $50 bills as in quote to poor as though that was streetcar transfers, meaning like people getting out in and out of public transfer 
transmit. Damn. So transit. So even even after his death, man, you know, he gave the word to somebody and said, you know what? Even after death, you know, we're still doing it right. You know what I mean? Like we're doing it, we're doing it legal, but we're still giving it back. You know? Yeah. Fuck Ebenezer <laughs> Scrooge and his cook goose for everyone. They're handing out fifties. Fifties and fifty. So, 50s and 52. So after the mob took over, that was the end of Bronzeville. Now the South Side is now a terrible neighborhood. What happened is anybody in the neighborhood that had any money moved out. You know, okay. it, was, it was taken. It became more of a violent neighborhood. It became what we know now as the South Side, right? Yeah. Sam Giancana eventually became boss of the outfit based off of, you know, he was that hotshot guy that came up with the new rackets. You know, he took over the number scheme and he ran it until June 17th, 1974, when legislators took the policy rackets away from the mob and renamed it the Illinois State Lottery. Yeah, last when they took that shit over. <laughs> they said, you know what? They did exactly what the mob did to Teddy, which was, hey, that's a good uh, racket you got there. How about we take it over? Then the government said, Hey, that's a good racket you got there. How about we take that over? Hey, and you know what's funny is Sam Giancana died a year after the, okay. the policy went over. So it was about the, t- the same time span. Somebody takes your shit. You Sam, so for- once you get into policy, like, once you're in that game, you're in there to the game. Once you lose the policy, you just lose your life. I know this is left field, but Theo, I'm giving him another name. Theo's still winning from the grave. Because Sammy, he only lasted, what, a year after the state took away his shit? Here's Theo fought Sammy for goddamn five, six years. Years before he took away his, his his quote shit. So anyways, fuck <laughs> off, Sammy. Well, Andy took he, he, he shot up his boy. With, he was like, all right, it's time to get serious. Let's send in the A team. And Teddy was like, fuck them, motherfucker. You said Fat Lenny after me. You know who I am? <laughs> <laughs> Did you see the Michael Bay scene where well, I ran when away? I die, I'm sending home my my fucking protection. <laughs> I'm putting on a suit I stitched with my fingers in a thimble. And goddamn, I'm going into the middle of the square where everybody loves me. I'm telling people. People hand out 50s and you guys can can cap me in the middle of the street you know if you've seen the movie hoodlum hoodlum is kind of the story uh lawrence fishburne plays bumpy johnson but Bumpy. he but he kind of plays bumpy johnson as ted Rowe because he's that tough he, teddy way better name than bumpy johnson bumpy johnson sounds like uh slang it, for an std like you does, got the herps man. it does i still love that movie to death but it does sound like bumpy think, johnson got some warts the only thing that made bumpy johnson was that weird little like that accent from the Bumpy Johnson. That was the only part I was like, all right, all right, I can get with it. <laughs> well, anything said in a Caribbean yeah, accent is the shit. I just think it is. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's... Oh, Yankee do the dandy. <laughs> like anything. In reality, by the 40s and 50s, uh, Bumpy Johnson was selling heroin into the black areas for the mob. Like, you watch Hoodlum, they kind of are telling they broke Ted off. Rose's story as Bumpy Johnson. In reality, Bumpy Johnson was like, yeah, I'll... I'll sling numbers and heroin in my neighborhood oh, for see, you. See, I, 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 I didn't know that part. Yeah, so the real like Bumpy Johnson was the opposite. He was a complete stooge for the mob. I lo- okay, I, well, apparently, I love the movie, but I didn't love it enough to really research the true Bumpy Johnson. All right, mm-hmm. so that's the story of Ted Rowe. So say good night to the bad guy. Go on. The last time you're going to see a bad guy like this again, let me tell you. All right, now uh, that we heard the tale, let's uh, cast this role. Uh, this is part of the show where we decide uh, who we think, if this was going to be a movie, who we think uh, should play the guy. Now, we already discussed it's been sort of based off Hoodlum, so like Lawrence Fishburne, like off the table. <laughs> like, yeah. But you know what? Since you said he's a big guy or whatever, I would say uh, Duke Winston. The guy, he plays uh, M'Baku in Black Panther, and okay. he also played the big dude in Us, if you saw that. Yeah. And he's been in a couple other things that I don't know, but, uh, and he's got a sweet name, Duke Winston. Or is it Winston if, Duke? If nothing else, you could sell that on a marquee. <laughs> you know? It might be Winston Duke. I, I might have that Still a pretty good name. But... What do and you that's... think? Before uh, we show the picture, you got a pre guest there, Tank? Yeah, actually, I was... The guy from the Black Panther. I didn't know what his name was until uh, until you said it, so thank you there. Um, I'm thinking, um, I know it's kind of a stretch, but The Rock. Uh, it is Winston Duke, by the uh, way. Winston Duke. He's tall. His name was Tough Ted. Maybe a fighter, but I'm not. I, I won't go there. I, I'm gonna stick with uh, you know the fella from Black Panther or maybe The Rock. You know what? 
Mahershala Ali would probably be good. I think he would play that. I didn't like him in Luke Cage. I really didn't. But now I have a better respect for him. Shut your fucking mouth. Well, now I have a better respect for him as an actor. But I didn't. I still don't like the character. I wish I knew who that Cotton was. Cotton Mouth. Man. He's I'm in more the of Green a TV Book. Show guy than a uh, movie guy. True Detective season three. A True Detective. With Stephen Dorff. Yeah, I know he's, Stephen Dorff. He's the he's other, other guy. Cop. Purple Haze. The black oh, cop. Oh, damn straight, man. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Because, yeah. well, in you Luke, your actors. I watched that whole season. I don't know who that actor is. But, uh, job, man. I'm, I'm a big fan of Mahershala Ali is the truth. And he's the fucking best motherfucker out there doing it right now. Well, I really, yeah, I really have a respect in everything else that I've seen him in. He's but, a damn uh, good actor, right? Yeah. In Luke Cage, I just didn't like that character. That. But in that, char- in that, uh, I didn't even know that was in that show, he played like a gangster that was semi straight but I don't know I didn't like that character because I saw him as a fake guy trying to be a gangster where in this Marsha Ali would definitely be able to play like just a guy that's being a businessman but has that street in him well the reason I think that he I think he'd be good like okay The Rock now, first of all I'm always down to cast The Rock Here's the thing is I could see him playing tough Teddy, like whooping ass and shooting fat Lenny and fucking still beating being guys on like the street. civil and like, but like being the tailor, like the, the rock, <laughs> the tailor. <laughs> like, you imagine those suits? God damn it. Dwayne, the Taylor Johnson and the rock will at least sell. It'll make a billion dollars. I don't know. Well, uh, my I, I'm part. down to see the rock, the fucking, uh, the, the tailor, you know, the now, plant worker rock. You've already seen the picture. Obviously, who would you cast if you had your, okay. Own? I went with Rick Fox. Now, Rick Fox is a basketball player, but he's done he's done some acting. He's been in some movies and some shows. I don't know who it is. Okay. So here's a picture of uh, Ted Rowe. On the left, right? Yeah. The yeah, biggest Ted motherfucker. Ted Rowe's a tall Damn, ass Yeah, motherfucker. he is. I mean, I'm Now I see why you picked an NBA player. 6'5", right? At least. I mean, that looks like 6'7". Yeah, he's a big dude. I mean, that's that next level tall. Yep. And but, he's, but he's not just, but he's the lankiness. Like, he's not a big dude by any matter, but he certainly rangy. is tall. I'm I'm with the, the basketball player pick. I'm with that. So these are also pictures of him when he's older. All right. Now, see, this is what I was talking about, guys. Look at the picture on the, on the right and pretend that this dude's 52. How yeah. can you, man? That, that, that looks like look an 80-year-old man. So that's what I'm saying. Tough Ted was at the point in his life where he was like, you know what, man? I'm 80. <laughs> he do that bullshit quizzes on the internet like, what's your real age? <laughs> this guy was fucking 80 in real life, and he was 52. Well, and, you know, honestly, you find out stomach cancer, right? So, I mean, yeah, he's... No, he, you're, you're, well, right. I mean, look, he's at, he's at war and shit. There might have been a long time where he's just thinking, like, you know, just, I got ulcers, fucking pound. You, you know what I'm saying? And it turns and out one day, like, well, you got stage four cancer. I don't know you just showed me in this picture how many years are apart, because the picture you just showed me was rick's rick fox without a mustache Th- this this picture on the right looks like my grandfather <laughs> so maybe the picture on the right was post diagnosis uh uh this is another picture he's the closest to us seated with the glasses yeah. Oh, all right. So that guy in the middle there is Ed is Jones. Richard Nixon in the background? <laughs> yeah, that really is. Sorry. <laughs> I am a crook. <laughs> yeah, that looks yeah, like it, man. Slight, yeah. And these old pictures, like oh. all of those people look like they're photoshopped into that picture. They, they do, do, right? <laughs> like, bad. None of them look like they're really there. I think to the point a, that this dude has like a white outline like, all around him. What is that, your aura? I, th- yeah. I think it's like photo enhancement, like to get these pictures oh, to work right. is what I'm guessing. Cause yeah, we, it's just right. crazy shit they had to do. Like, cause yeah, because the background, they look like ghosts. They look, look at like, like demons. Uh, even, <laughs> even Ted Rowe there looks like he's got like an edge around him. And just this picture right here, it's like, dude, you heard a lot about Capone, but Chicago back in those days, it was really big. It was really tough, Teddy and Big Ed, man. Yeah. You know, I mean, they <laughs> were real. doing it right, dude. They were like Mahershala Ali. They were the truth. Like he said, I'll never be a tough tank. Well, you know what? I was more along the lines of tough Teddy anyways compared well, to Al Capone. When was it that Al Capone was killed? What year was that? Well, he got sent to prison in 33. Oh, yeah, he got sent to prison. And then when he got, he was never the same. It ain't like he Yeah, he got, uh, he went crazy syphilis, with syphilis yeah, and then never came back out. So, yeah, so 1933, I mean, they sort of rose as he fell. Yeah. I'm just, and, and I was kind of more meaning, like, like you when you see in the history books, like, you see about Al Capone, oh, like, yeah. left and right. It's like, but this is a much more impressive story. Well, the thing if is, you, if you, if you, Al Capone was actually in the mob, these guys 
guys aren't in the you also don't hear shit about the purple gang or nothing like that but you hear all the time about the saint valentine's day massacre You're right and you don't hear about the siamese twins or eddie mm-hmm. flat like the people that did it you hear about al capone ordered the saint Valentine. like al capone gets credit for that like Looking up information on Teddy Rowe, there's a guy that wrote the book, or he co-authored the book, uh, Robin Hood of the Hood, about Ted Rowe. His name is Michael Rowe. He's a black dude from Chicago, and they're not related at all. <laughs> but he said, kind of what you're saying, is that if you want to do, you want information on uh, El Capone, you want information on Lucky Luciano, you can go get books and books and books. When you go get information on Ted Rowe, you're, you're getting clips out of magazines or quotes out of an article here or article there. The information just isn't out there like that, you know? And it, and it's crazy because, I mean, it's a good story. Like you said, and, and I think that's a credit to me because all those guys, yeah. I find those dudes. Those, <laughs> I found those stories. I, yeah, I definitely. I mean, not to be cheesy, but I definitely liked the uh, saying hello to Tough Teddy for damn sure, man. As an interesting character, and I mean, if I had to do crime a way <laughs> that that Tank would do it, it would be in the in the form of Tough Teddy. Well, I mean, well then let's uh, go to our next set, which is uh the Defcon. So where would you feel on the DEFCON scale? We do, well, real quick for people that don't know or whatever, I'll explain. The DEFCON scale is DEFCON 1 through 5, 1 being the top, like, that's red code, red team go, we're all in. 5 being, like, not so bad. Like, for me, my per everybody scales it differently, you know what I mean? Yep. For me, my scale is, you know, number one's for those psychopathic killers that just, they just like to kill, and that's their shit. And five is pretty much like they're a criminal, but they're not violent necessarily. And then, you know, it goes from there. Like three would be like he did a couple kills, but he wasn't a hardcore killer. Like a two for me would be like maybe a self-defense kill, but not like a kill. Like that's just my personal skill. But, you know, from top to where would you put him? Uh, Just for... (laughs) I got really dorky last time with this, um, and I'm going to get really dorky this time, too. Dork it up. I want to give Tough Ted, like, a solid three. If I'm being honest with myself, if I'm being honest with the DEF CON scale. Keep it real. Killing, Be honest. Killing wise, he's a four. Because I like him wise, he's a three. But that does not take away from my overall opinion of Double T, that he is a badass motherfucker. T squared. Whether Damn straight. T2. Whether he was... <laughs> You know, Judgment Day. Fucking smacking down the mob in the the you know mobs heyday years. I mean, it's arguable when their heyday was, but you know, 40s is right right in that time to uh to just giving back to the community even though he was a straight motherfucking mm-hmm. criminal, dude. <laughs> so I'm I I gotta give him four because that's what I think he fairly deserves. Three is uh I think a little generous for me. Word. Well, mine is he's he's just a five. Like he did a kill, but like you know it, it, they were popping. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I they mean, popping. yeah, and he got acquitted of those, whatever he said, you know, fuck the mob. And I mean, he did the numbers, gave back to the community. He really don't have much blood on his hand at all. Shit, he didn't even do no jail time. I mean, and like we said, eventually the Illinois just took it over. So he really wasn't even that much of a criminal or elite. Like for me, he's a straight five. Like he's, he's barely even a bad guy in my book at all. Like I'm he's. With you. He's a cool, that's a cool motherfucker. He's bad meaning, bad, not nah, bad meaning. Oh, wait, no. Bad meaning. Ah, fucked it. I fucked it up. <laughs> you want to try again? Yeah, you want no, to go back? No, no. I'm just going to take my. Uh, it's only going to get worse. Yeah, Some people it. say third time's a charm. <laughs> Tank says two times. I'm no, done, dude. No, nope, no, no. that. Whatever. I I'll never to strike out. I'm just done. <laughs> hey, fuck that. Softball rules. <laughs> I tried bootlegging twice back to back, and I couldn't say that for some reason. I quit. So it's all beer. fair. Sorry. Well, see, I, I agree. I, I go five only because like you hear the story and i'm like yeah this is a great bad guy story i'm gonna tell it and at some point you're like well is this even a bad guy yeah, yeah. this is just a guy i did guy. think that up until but i mean it really was a story worth hearing i mean but the, but the fight against... in the mob doesn't even get him a one point <laughs> like five years like well no that's not a bad thing for well, see, me I, that's that to me is a cool thing like i, I don't want to it... make you guys change i'm just <laughs> i'm just pleading tt's well i'm just saying that doesn't make him a bad guy for anything that makes no, him a good guy for I, me I like that right. was even yes, better for me. But, you know? Well, I mean, I guess but it's is just it always... bad meaning good, not bad meaning bad. <laughs> like, like the way Michael Jackson he's means a badass it? motherfucker because shut he's your mouth. Still... <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I think, see, I rate it on, honestly, most, okay, if a guy's a one, those are typically guys you probably wouldn't want to be around, because those are, you're just fucking straight murderers. Yeah. I mean, outside of Super Killer, you know, I mean, like, he's kind of interesting, because he's like a fucking, like a video game in, in a real person, but. Well, see, once again, I guess to, I didn't. To me, to me I right. think a five is, it's not how much I like. Yeah. I like Ted Rowe a lot, but on a scale of how bad is he, I don't, I, he's barely a criminal. He might, he might have did a lot of, but you're right. He wasn't in and out of jail. He wasn't. So I'm all right. I'm with you guys. Well, it, it well, wouldn't matter. Bring, I'm trying to bring <laughs> that number down for Teddy. Well, either either way, we do standard MMA scoring, which would make it a, a majority decision. Ma- majority decision five. And I'm I'm so. I'm cool with that. I can I can I'm I'm all good with that because I can see I can see because up until remember when I called for it, you know, in like 40, uh, 47 or some shit. I'm like this motherfucker better step step some shit up. But you know I get it because in forty seven I was on the same page like wait is he even a bad guy is like <laughs> this he's a hero but bad guy or not it's a story worth being told i mean in the hey, words of, a lot of good guys who do good right yeah and i mean he did enough bad to to bring him on the wrong side mm-hmm. of law i mean well, in the words of a criminal for well, yeah. the words of take not to get dorky with it but uh <laughs> it is black history month and this guy i mean it is so say hello to the bad guy and he's a criminal but like he's almost a good like a good role model for black like you just said uh you look up al capone or whatever and like there's books on him this guy there's just magazines so i mean it definitely is a story worth throwing out there i mean this guy if he was in the mob he would go down in the books as one of their top earners like that amount of money and being on making time for that sort of shit i mean that's some black history shit i mean length length of time he was technically started started bootlegging in the 20s died at in 52 that's 32 years of criminal and i mean he took a little criminal time off years, to work that's a plant. lot of years right yeah, you know didn't do no time only shot one dude and it, mm-hmm. and it was because i mean we were popping and that's the stuff yeah, that makes me want to that's the stuff that made me want to rate him higher because i was like but he didn't get caught you know what i mean like are we just rating dudes better because they're dumbasses and get caught <laughs> like i'm but anyways i'm hey it's whatever it's your scale yeah, like I'm i said it's him. hard to it's hard to say a scale yeah well, we exactly can't micromanage you, your scale you no, scale it by you what i'm yeah, with you, you know though I, mean? I know you know it's like I'm, I'm with you we're all our own dragons with our own scales you <laughs> know what i mean that's right it's going to the streets hey y'all it's revolution up in this bitch Set the alarm, Five. All right, that's uh, it's the life and times of one tough Teddy. You guys got anything else, Locke? You got? Well, yeah, we, uh, I guess we didn't cover it earlier, but uh, Swaino. So we got the intro music. So we gotta make sure we thank Swaino. Uh, so go subscribe to his YouTube channel. Puts out a lot of content. Speaking of subscribing, subscribe to us now that we're out here. So far, we're on Spotify. We're coming to a lot of other uh, platforms. Most of them will be iTunes soon. You know, working our way up. You know, we're we're Teddy in the tailor shop right now. You know, we're sweeping floors one day. <laughs> well, one day we'll be running policies. Right. You know what I mean? I, I would say from an outsider perspective, you guys are at the Detroit. You guys are in the Detroit. <laughs> See, we just got to Detroit. Detroit. Yeah. We're in there. Like this syndicate wasn't game, built yeah, in a day. Yeah, yeah, damn straight. And we got uh, Instagram going on. What's uh, the name on Instagram? Uh, Bad Guy Podcast yep. on Instagram. So follow us there. We're on the uh, social meds, and uh, we're probably going to get Facebook, all that sort of shit going in the future. Till then, there's Tank and Locke. I'm Dan the Man. And remember, he fought the mob in the Mob 1. <laughs>